I'd like to thank Cash for inviting us. I'd also like to thank Becky Berger for the wonderful article she put in yesterday's Tribune. I don't know how many of you are here because this is, that was the first you knew about it, but it was a great article. Uh, we call ourselves the Silver Bag Ladies. If you have seen us in action, you know why. Most times we have four or five actresses. They each play two or three parts, and they carry their props, particularly their hats, in their silver bags and change them around. For this play, we don't need that because each one only plays one part. They're all playing the same woman at different ages in her life, but they don't have to change clothes, so they don't need the silver bags. Um, our play is Reader's Theater, which means that they read, actually here it looks like letters that they're writing. The lo lovely thing about Reader's Theater is if one of them faints out here in the closet, we just call somebody in the audience. <laughs> and maybe that's why you all left the front row. <laughs> so, uh, it's never happened, but if it does, we just call on somebody to get up and read. You men are safe because they're all women's parties. <laughs> Our play tonight is about Mary Pierce, who is the first white woman settler in Geneva Township. If you're not aware of where Geneva Township is, it's the next one east of us. And they came here originally, the family from New York, and then for a while they lived in South Haven, and then they moved out to Geneva, and the house was near 43, about halfway to Bangor. I understand the house is falling down now. Um, turns out there are lots of her descendants living around. Uh, we have a couple of them here tonight. I don't know whether they're hiding, they're hiding back there in the back. One of them even went to school here in Hartman. Um, <laughs> so she's got double connection for being here. And we had an email from a man who was a lawyer in New York who wrote with all kinds of extra information about the family so that if we get asked to do this again, we've got more details to put on. His mother was Virginia Brown, who was a member of AAUW and lived over on Pearl Street across from Elaine and West Stevens. Elaine is hiding in the closet here. <laughs> the cast consists of six members, and I will introduce them now. This is not necessarily the order they will appear in, and afterwards, if you don't know who they are, you can ask. Lois Schwartz plays Mary as a 10-year-old. Melanie Rupert plays her when she's a little older, about 21. Then Ann Hobbick, she gets a little bit older. Then Sue Torp, Elaine Stevens, and Elizabeth Miller. And they will be going in and out, so I don't know who's sitting in the back row, but you may occasionally have to pick your feet up to get out of the way of our actors and actresses. <laughs> And so, let us welcome the Silver Bag Ladies. Isn't she precious? Such tiny hands. And those big eyes. They seem to follow you everywhere. What did they decide to name her? Well, Mr. Roy said that he thought that they were going to name her Mary Sapretta. How about that, which is a huge name for such a tiny baby. Well, at least she'll never forget her birth date. July 4th, 1822, Independence Day. It doesn't seem possible that it's just 45 years from yeah. that very first Independence Day. Who knows what the future will hold for this tiny little girl? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. She'll grow up here in New York, but with all the people moving west, perhaps she'll be one of that group that goes out to the territory. Troy, Michigan Territory, July 3rd, 
1833. Dearest Patty, <clears throat> greetings from the territory of Michigan. I can't believe we're finally here. We arrived in the frontier city of Detroit yesterday. Father said if I wanted a letter to go out to you on the next mailboat, I should write to you tonight. We've had such a great time in the month since we left New York, period. Going along that Erie Canal was exciting. Some of the bargemen were really characters. Mother wouldn't let us girls stay up on deck too long, said the language those men used wasn't fit for little girls like my sisters and me to hear. I heard it before. <laughs> then we sailed along Lake Erie. What a lovely way to travel. I saw a bear and two cubs at one place, plus lots of deer and birds. Now we're in a city that used to be a fort called Pontchartrain, a French-sounding name. The French got here first and named everything. You should see the natives, not like our New York Iroquois in Erie. Here they are Wyandotte, Ottawa, Miami, but the most unusual name is Potawatomi. I laughed just trying to say it. Tomorrow is Independence Day and I'll be 12. I always thought we'd spend our birthdays together you on July 3rd and me on the 4th. I'll bet you're having a party back in Pulteneyville with all our friends. I wish I could be there. I suppose the Wilson girls and Beth and Caroline will be there. Did your mother make you invite that horrible Billy Andrews and pesty Johnny Clarkson? Every time I mention something back home, Father says, Mary, the future of our great nation depends on citizens moving west. But why does the future of our nation have to depend on me? Tomorrow we leave for Father's new job as postmaster in a little town named Brady. He says the nearest bigger town has another funny name, Kalamazoo. Honestly, such names. We're told the rest of the trip will be by ox cart and that it's a long, bumpy ride. I wish it could be by train. I hope Brady will be a nice place to live. I already miss our big white house and the swings in the backyard. I hope the new family will be nice, but not too nice. I don't want you to like them better than you like me. I'll miss our school. Next year, we'd have Miss Alexander. How are your piano lessons going? Father says once we get settled, he'll see if he can't find a teacher and piano for me. I hope I can keep up with you. Mother just came in to say I must put out the light and get to bed. I'm sending you a hundred hugs and kisses from Michigan Territory. Fondly, Mary Sarepta. Kalamazoo, Michigan, October 18, 1841. Dearest Patty, it's a lovely day. Even better, it's my wedding day. In just three hours, I will be Mrs. Clark Pierce. Oh, wow. 
I wish you could meet Clark. He's so handsome and such a gentleman. Ooh. Clark and his two brothers came west from New Hampshire. They went first to the Illinois Territory, and then Clark and his brother Daniel decided Michigan had more opportunities. I'm glad they came back. So many settlers here are from New York. It's very different than back home, especially the lack of supplies in the stores. Everything has to be brought by ox cart, train or boat. So few fashions and no new fashions. Oh. No fancy wedding dress for me. I do have a new hat. But no dress with a train. We plan to live in Kalamazoo until Clark can go to his new job. It's at a place called Mouth O River. Over on Lake Michigan. They've started a sawmill there. Lumbering is everything around here. I thought there were a lot of trees in New York, but nothing like around here. Once the sawmill is up and running, the plan is for Clark to work there and I'll manage the hotel boarding house for the workers. Imagine me being in charge of the cooking and keeping the hotel. What would our friends think of that? Oh my. It's quite the wilderness around here. Deer, raccoons, snakes, and even wolves. Clark's brother Daniel had an amazing experience with wolves. He was out at his farm, and at the end of a morning of cutting down trees, he left his muddy boots outside the cabin's front door and went into the village for supplies. <coughs> when he got back, his boots were missing. Daniel thought one of the natives must have taken them. But three days later, he caught a wolf in one of his traps, and in its stomach, was the undigested heel of a boot. <laughs> Daniel knew it was his because he'd re-nailed the sole a few weeks earlier and recognized the pattern of the nails. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how men outnumber women around here. Many of them seem to be looking for wives, so tell our unmarried girlfriends. However, I got the best one. Well, dearest Patty, I must close and help Mother finish setting the table for our wedding breakfast. We used to plan on being in each other's weddings, but now you're Mrs. Johnny Clarkston, and I'll soon be Mrs. Clark Pierce. With much love, Mary. Mouth O' River, Michigan, August 1844. Dear Cousin Patty, this will be just a short letter, but I wanted to let you know we've moved from Kalamazoo. Clark and I and our little boy Almond are over on the Big Lake in a lumber camp at the mouth of the Black River. You'd laugh at how we live. I used to be so fussy about everything being clean and tidy. That was before I lived in a sawmill town. <laughs> we have sawdust everywhere. Baby Almond says he plays in it, and at first he tried tasting it. He quickly learned it tastes awful. I thought we would be living in our own cabin over here. After all, Clark had helped build the first real house here. But before we could get moved in, it burned down. 
Fire is a big problem because of all the wood chips. So we're looking, we're, we're staying here in the hotel boarding house where I'm supposed to be managing the cooking and cleaning, a nearly impossible task with a busy two-year-old underfoot and a never-ending coat of sawdust on everything. We no, live, no longer live in a territory. Three years ago, Michigan became the 26th state in the United States. Everyone around here was very excited about that. My parents and sisters are still back in Brady, although the name of the village is now changed to Vicksburg. Changing place names around here is common. When he's not working at the mill, Clark goes out to our farm. It's about five miles southeast in the middle of the forest. Clark bought the land from Judge J.R. Monroe, who seems to own most of the land around here. The farm cost $21 an acre, and I don't know how we'll ever get it paid off. <laughs> Fortunately, farming and lumbering aren't the only income sources here. Many of the men hunt and trap. The government pays a bounty of up to $12 for a good wolf hide. Although there seems to be plenty of wolves about, trapping the clever creatures is not very easy. <laughs> I look forward to fall and a frost to kill the mosquitoes. I believe they're as big as hummingbirds. They're a terrible problem. Nothing gets rid of them, even smoke from the fires. Little Almond is covered with bites, which he insists on scratching. I keep him in long sleeves and pants, but the bugs still get him. I'll close now and start the deer meat for stew for tonight's dinner. We seem to eat a lot of venison around here, that and fish from the lake. Wish we could see each other. I'd love to see your two little ones, which with much love, Mary Pierce. Geneva Township, Michigan, summer 1858. Dearest Patty, I hope this letter finds you and your growing family all well. As you can see by our address, we've left Mouth of River, which is now called South Haven, and moved full time to our farm which is five miles from town. I don't miss the sawdust at all. But sometimes I get lonely for visitors. Even though we're on the main road between Kalamazoo and South Haven, sometimes we go several days without visitors. And the mosquitoes out here are even bigger than in town. Believe it or not, I was the first woman settler in the township. And our second son, Irving, was the first child born out here. Now, with six children of our own, we make our own little village. <laughs> You'd be amazed that we can all fit into our cabin. It's really only one room where we cook, eat, sleep, and entertain. Our children sleep in a loft above, although when there are overnight guests traveling through, the girls sleep down here with us, and the visitors sleep up in the loft with the boys. Our little cabin was even the school for three terms, until a real schoolhouse could be built. 
To protect our store of food from marauding possums and raccoons, we even have a root cellar over in one corner. That's also the place we hide runaway slaves. Yes, we're part of the underground railroad system. I think Clark and I are the only abolitionists here in Geneva. Of course, there aren't many people here at all. You'll be surprised to learn that I am the one who drives the runaways onto the next safe house. We felt it was less suspicious to have a woman do the driving than a man. Clark didn't want the children to know for fear they'd talk. That doesn't worry me. There are so few people out here, who would they talk to? <laughs> I'm pleased to tell you that South Haven now has two churches. Two churches and at least six taverns. <laughs> that gives you an idea of how civilized we are. The mill workers get paid at noon on Saturday, and by Sunday morning, they've drunk up most of their money. I'm glad for the children's sakes that we're not closer to town. Around here, there's growing debate about slavery and a possible conflict between northern and southern states. It's so good to hear news of you and yours right when you can. I so look forward to your letters. Much love, Mary Pierce and family. Geneva Township, summer 1864. Dearest Cousin Patty, these are indeed troubling times. Although all is well here on our Geneva farm, word of the battles fought elsewhere is distressing. Our sons, Almond and Irving, are both with Michigan regiments but letters are few and far between. I pray for their safety and that a solution can be found for our nation's distress. And I pray for poor Mr. Lincoln. I often wonder what happened to the runaway slaves we helped on their way. Did they make it to Canada? Or were they captured by bounty hunters? It's awful to think about it. It's so nice just to sit for a while. The girls and I spent the morning and most of the past week sewing. My sisters had sent us 88 yards of wonderful fabric and we've been busy making clothes for everyone. They seem to wear out clothes so fast. At least with our six, there was usually someone younger and smaller to inherit those outgrowth items. And I am so thankful for Mr. Levi and those denim men's pants he created. <laughs> the boys complained that they were stiff and scratchy at first but they never wore out. Second son Irving always said that one of the advantages of being younger and getting hand-me-downs was that Almond had softened up the fabric <laughs> by the time he outgrew them. Now they're off to war. I don't know what they're wearing 
and I worry about them. Are they warm? Are they dry? Do they have food? Are they safe? Will they come back home again? Fortunately, here in Michigan, we women don't wear those full skirts with bustles so fashionable back east. So the 88 yards should give each of us a new outfit for winter. In addition to sewing, Laura and Gertrude have been helping me preserve and can for the winter. We can buy almost nothing except for shoes, salt, and some of Clark's tools. Our store shelves are quite empty because of the war. I understand it's even worse in other parts of the frontier, and at least we always have meat. Well, it's getting dark, so I'll close <coughs> now. I hate to use up all our candles and lamp oil. Wish I could see you and your growing family of children and grandchildren. I pray you are safe from this terrible war. Much love always, Mary. Geneva Township. July 5th, 1884. Okay. My dearest Patty. Oh. Oh, I was sorry to hear that your husband John has not been well. My Clark continues to be in good health. But he's 72 now. <clears throat> and insists on working long days on the farm. I did get him to take me to town take time yesterday to go into town for the Independence Day celebration <sighs> and my birthday. After the speeches and the music, we were all invited back to our daughter Laura's house for lunch. Huh. I am so proud of her. Well, of course, I'm, I'm proud of all of them, but Laura has done so much. She decided at an early age that she wanted to be a teacher and insisted on going off to Ypsilanti to Teachers College. Oh, I remember I was so worried when <laughs> uh, that day putting her on the train oh, from Kalamazoo to Ypsilanti. But she looked too young but she was so determined. Fortunately, after graduation, she chose to return to South Haven to teach. And there she met and married John Wilcox, a fine man. Okay, our Independence Day celebration yesterday was certainly different than the first one we celebrated here in the wilderness back in 49. Yesterday, there were about 200 people present. <laughs> but on that first South Haven one, it was just us, two other couples, and an old hunter, all of whom are gone now. But we loaded the children yesterday into a wagon, then we adults rode on horseback, and off we went through the woods to the big lake. We had a little picnic lunch, oh, and then some of the men told what they remembered their fathers and grandfathers talking about those momentous times in the 60s and 70s. It hardly seems possible that it was almost 100 years ago. Oh, 
it was such a small celebration back then that we felt proud to be Americans. I still feel that way. Again, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. I, I see Clark coming to take me now to drive us to church. So we'll close this letter. Your very loving cousin, Mary. <laughs> <clears throat> Royce Pierce died at the age of 66 in 1888. She was surrounded by her family, respected by her friends and neighbors, and loved by her husband Clark, <laughs> and loved by her children and grandchildren. She was always pleased to be known as the first pioneer woman in Geneva Township in the state of Michigan. Thank you.